A recent grant by the International National Trust Organization, INTO, provided funds to allow the National Trust for the Cayman Islands to visit the Belgrove Plantation in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, a former slave plantation in the United States, which was also the site of the Battle of Cedar Creek, one of the Civil War's key battles, as part of an educational and cultural exchange. The trip was an opportunity for the NTCI to learn more about the systems in place at Belgrove, under the care of Belgrove's executive director, Kristen Liaise, as well as to exchange and trade ideas. Both the NTCI and Belgrove were initially part of a program by INTO, referred to as Reimagining Sites of Slavery, or RISE, which included other national trust organizations from around the world, such as Africa, Jamaica, Bermuda, and many more. With the Cayman Islands still uncovering much of its past with regards to slavery, both the initial RISE Zoom sessions and discussions proved extremely fruitful, and there are now efforts in motion to do a site dig at the Jackson's Wall, one of the National Trust's heritage sites in Grand Cayman. There is also a high probability that slaves were present around the Mission House and played a role in the everyday life of those who lived there. In addition to being a former plantation, Belgrove is a prominent home which features heavily in American history. While at Belgrove, I had the chance to meet with several persons on the team that assist in the on-site educational activities and learn firsthand what life may have been like for those who lived and toiled there. Among the persons who were instrumental during my time at Belgrove were Jerome Bias, an African-American artist in residence at Belgrove, who makes furniture from the era of slavery which his family may have interacted with based on regional styles from the time period. An intellectual and historian, he explained more about his work. Before they start selling them off. So that's a long time for the peop these people to be interacting with the China, the, there's, a, yeah. there's a linen press upstairs. That's a long time for someone to be interacting with the linen press. Now you're also gonna have to stop and think, it's like, the linen, so the linen press, in order for the, the Heights to buy the linen press, the farm has to be profitable. Because mm -hmm. if the farm's not profitable, they're going to start selling people. Uh, that's the, the people are money. It's dollar, dollar, dollars on the hoof. Yeah. And so the enslaved population is going to be working really hard so that they can keep, so, so their cousin and their grandmother don't get sold. Oh, yes. And part of the pro. The result of that is that the Heights are then allowed able to buy stuff for themselves. I gotcha. So when I look at the, the linen press, that's a Winchester Valley linen press upstairs, I can look at it and I go, okay, the same population, they, they pay for that. They pay for that. My gosh. And yeah. then the person who's using it, I mean, the Heights might get their clothes out of it, but they've got an same person who's dressing them. Yes. So that person is going to be with them for their entire life. Another notable encounter I had the privilege of experiencing was that of Matt Greer, an archaeologist who's been working at Belgrove to uncover artifacts and learn more about the lifestyle of the slaves who lived there. Matt's work is an important part of telling the story of Belgrove and was an eye-opening experience as the National Trust hopes to explore the possibility of learning more about slavery in Grand Cayman. Um, I knew that I wanted to do my dissertation research at Bell Grove, so I was doing a little bit of work before I went to Syracuse. And what I was really interested in at the time was the domestic slave trade. Um, and so Bell Grove has a strong connection to the Montpelier Plantation on the other side of the mountains. Um, 15 people from Montpelier were the original 15 people that were enslaved here, and then another nine, I believe, people came around a couple years later. So I really wanted to look at what their lives were like, because the Heights were in the process of building and bringing people together um, at the same time that Montpelier had a multi-generational enslaved community. So I wanted to see, like, how does this, what does this difference mean for people? I didn't end up getting the data that I needed for that. Um, so I had to shift my focus and instead I looked at just what was slavery and enslaved people's lives like in the Shenandoah Valley. Um, and unfortunately, it wasn't until the 90s that historians were like, oh yeah, there was slavery here. Everyone, was, there was all these random excuses they were making up, like 
the there were Germans here and Germans didn't like to enslave people, which isn't true. Or they grew wheat and slavery doesn't work well with wheat and that's not true. Um, so in the 90s, I first started talking about slavery in the valley, but no one had looked at enslaved people. It always been like, how did slavery affect local religion? Um, so I wanted to look at just what was life like for enslaved people. Um, so I think we might have a map of the site over here. So we have some, we have some documents showing buildings out here in the field across the street. And they had done some research out there in the 90s and seen that there was probably an enslaved quartering site out there. Um, so I, that's where I started my research. We went through and we did, um, we essentially looked through the whole site and it, it's really large. It's about an acre and a half of land. Um, we looked to see where artifact concentrations were at the site and where homes would have been. Um, and we spent two years doing, about three years doing that. And then we came through later and did more extensive excavations uh, at one of the enslaved houses and a bunch of the trash scatters around the plantation. Almost all of it had been there. There was a, so if you see this picture like here, there are some barns and a stable. We did a little bit of work out there, um, but not a lot. And on the actual plantation here, this being a plantation, would this be a good place to do a dig as well? Oh yes, it, it's amazing. Um, we have really good records. We actually have a list of people that were enslaved here, which you don't get at many places in the United States. It's really weird to have that information. Um, and the preservation is amazing. So a lot of sites in Virginia have them plowed, which breaks up the artifacts, moves them around, but we don't have that here. Uh, the fields that we're looking at are unplowed. And we also have the bedrock here is limestone. And that means that the clay has a low acidity and that lets artifacts preserve better than it does in the rest of Virginia. Around the manor house, they did that mostly in the 70s and 80s. I would be interested in maybe doing some more, trying to look at some of the outbuildings and how would say people would have been, what they would have been doing in these buildings. So what about the Civil War? I mean, there's gotta be treasures out here from the oh, Civil there's War a bunch. too, huh? Um, there's a lot. Um, that's not my area of interest, so mm -hmm. I, I sort of leave that alone as much as I can. But if you did a dig, certainly things would pop up from yes, that yes. too. Yes, yes, we find Civil War stuff, um, we catalog it and save it. Um, I just won't do a whole lot with the information once we've done that. I was also able to attend a town hall meeting where several of the parks and agencies in the Shenandoah Valley come together quarterly to update each other on what is happening in their respective areas. This was another eye-opening experience which made me think that a similar meeting of agencies in Cayman could be useful. The gift shop at Belgrove Plantation was another interesting stop and I was able to learn how items are procured from local artisans for sale.